Hello and welcome to this week's Talking Africa podcast brought to you by the Africa Report magazine, where we get behind the news from the continent, which you can always check out online at theafricareport.com. I'm Anne-Marie Visada. In this episode, we'll be discussing Nigeria's proliferating security clashes, what's going on, and what can be done to address them. Mediated by our own Patrick Smith, we'll hear from two experts from the Global Rights Organization that has just produced a detailed report on the differing security threats emerging across Nigeria. Abiodun Bayouan, based in Abuja, Nigeria, she is the executive director of Global Rights and is co-chair of the African Coalition for Corporate Accountability. And we have Chidi Ansa Modinkalu. He is the chair of Global Rights and until recently chaired the governing council of Nigeria's National Human Rights Commission. So my name is Abiodun Bayouan. I'm the executive director at Global Rights. And I'm Chidi Anselm Odinkalu. I chair the advisory board of uh, Global Rights. We're both co-conveners of uh, Nigeria Mons, which is uh, a coalition of over 100 groups that works on tracking the atrocities connected with the ongoing violence in Nigeria and has done that since 2018. Thanks very much. Welcome to the um, Africa Report podcast. First of all, I wanted to ask you about the report that you've recently produced uh, with the Global Rights Organization, and you've been tracking the numbers of violent deaths in Nigeria over the past year, I believe. Could you explain to the listeners the methodology you used and and, and the numbers that you came up with, uh, and why, to some to some extent, people think. This is a little surprising because we're we're talking about major outbreaks of violence with an insurgency, with a herd of farmer clashes, with uh, increasing criminalization, and the numbers seem quite modest. I mean, it's a stupid thing to say, but you know, just in relative to a population of over two hundred and ten million people, could you explain the methodology and how you came to those those numbers? Well, the numbers are deliberately conservative. Um, They are uh, double verified numbers from our partners situated in the states across the country, um, counting only deaths from mass atrocities and incidents clearly um, decided to be mass atrocities and not just um, any uh, violent killing. So, for example, you don't have armed robberies um, and um, in, uh, isolated incidents in this numbers. And the numbers are du- uh, double blind verified, which means that they must come from two independent sources who are blind to each other's reports. Uh, and um, this are very meticulously um, investigated and verified before we count these numbers. So th- this tells you for every single number that you find in this report that this is the barest minimum of water support. Right, right. Um, one of the obvious things to say about it, I guess, is, is the extent to which you very you identify the problems in the Northwest as being the worst in the country. And a lot of people think, well, we thought the insurgency was in the Northeast. Can you explain what, what that sort of reflects in terms of the, the causes of the violence and who, who's... Who's suffering from it? Well, the Northeast would have been traditionally, this would have been the reverse position uh, 10 years ago um, in Nigeria, where you had the conflict in the Northeast um, was uh, more violent than any other parts of the country. But that in recent times, that other parts of the country have combusted while all the focus was on the Northeast. And so you have the Northwest, the middle belt of the country. and that the conflict in the South-South was never a priority and that it got progressively worse. Right, right. Um, So in a sense, you've got like three or four different conflict systems going on in in, in the country. Um, I wonder if you could explain those. Um, Maybe Chidi, um, given... uh, 
could you, well, how would you describe the various conflict systems we're seeing in Nigeria and how they're now interacting with each other? I don't know whether to call them conflict systems or whether you're simply. I, I'll probably dis, I'll probably use the word pathologies. Um, right. Uh, okay. Uh, and the the reason is in it's difficult. Uh, obviously, when you see mass killings or mass atrocities on some of the scales going on in Nigeria with limited uh, or no response from government, the first thing is that there is a failure of government or governance across the board. Um, the, I think that's the very first thing that we identify in the report. Um, the, the second thing, and the failure of gov- government is evident in the fact that a major factor in the uh, atrocities is the absence or, or, or the absence of governance. Uh, so on governed territories, on governed spaces, is a major feature of the violence. And a clear example is Niger State. Niger State is the biggest state in Nigeria, of the biggest of Nigeria's 36 states uh, mm. and the federal capital territory. And the disparities in size are phenomenal uh, across Nigeria's states. Niger State is about 76,300 square kilometers. That's the largest state. The smallest mm. state is Lagos State, which is about 3,000 777 square kilometers. Right. Now, wow. the, so Niger State is now, uh, and it's, Niger State is broadly identified as in the north central of Nigeria. So it's neither northeast nor northwest. But it has now worked its way up to somewhere between the, uh, somewhere about the third, uh, uh, in, in term, third state in terms of the intensity of killings. The, um, the first state, of course, is Borno State which is in the northeast. Borno State, however, is also the second largest state in Nigeria at 70,800 or thereabouts square kilometers. Right. Now, the third state, uh, the third largest state is Taraba State, which is in the top five, I believe, of the killings. But the number three state in terms of killings is Kaduna State, which is the fourth largest state in Nigeria. So, Ungoverned spaces is clearly a major problem. And it, now the interesting thing is when you, when you look at the list of states I've just mentioned, Niger is in north central, Borno is in northeast, Kaduna state is in northwest. They represent the three top states in terms of killings in Nigeria. So ungoverned spaces is number one issue here. And that means government is failing the people. Now, the second thing you you look at um, uh, would be the Northwest. And the Northwest is that part that led Nigeria in the introduction of Sharia uh, uh, at the beginning of this millennium. Uh, And quite clearly, the promise of Sharia as a system of security has failed. Uh, And the Northwest... um, now, per capita, this, the, uh, the, the, the state, uh, although it's, it, it's got about 39,000 square kilometers or thereabout, Zamfara State in the northwest and Katsina State, which is presents home state, are two of the states that are presenting uh, mass killings and mass atrocities in Nigeria pathologies. And one of the issues is ungoverned border ter- borderlands, Nigeria's international borders. Now, President Buhari offers the explanation that the killing of Gaddafi in Libya was a factor. Uh, President Buhari's um, village in Daura is about 15, 25 kilometers to Niger Republic. And there is a great deal of smuggling of arms taking place through those northern borders. Nigeria's borders with Niger Republic are somewhere in the region of about 1,400 kilometers stretch. Poorly governed, that is a problem. Now, a third issue is the conflict with uh, or, or the uh, ungoverned herders. <laughs> All of this is ungoverned. Um, right. Now, mm. the you know, ruminant transhumans takes place and the intensity of the transhumans, of the m- movement of herders north to south increases in the dry season. And in the dry season, the intensity of the killings rises because of the insistence of the herders on the use of water sources and grazing in on other people's lands. So that is a third thing. And the fourth issue is the insurgency in the northwest, northeast of Nigeria. 
the borders between these four now have collapsed, really. And they, it's difficult to know which is which. It seems quite clear that displaced Boko Haram operatives have moved, have crossed territories into the northwest, and some of them may in fact be armed herders in vast parts of the country. Uh, and I, we cannot rule out any of these anymore. Right, right. I mean, just just to try and look for a second at the, the, the insurgency uh, as a particular issue. It, it is, as you say, started with the killing of Yusuf uh, and then the escalation of Boko Haram from a kind of proselytizing movement into a, an armed insurgency force over the what, last 10 years or more. Um, alongside them, you then have had, well, you had splits within Boko Haram, then you had the development of this uh, sort ISIS. of... Uh, exactly, yeah, ISWAP, uh, they call themselves, yeah, Islamic State in West Africa Correct. province, which essentially province, a sort of... Yes. With his, uh, Daesh, is 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 backing. Yes. Uh, and they seem to have a slightly different strategy. They were, they were more targeted on... Uh, foreign intervention and less and appear to be also trying to build some sort of local alliances uh whereas um yeah um i i just wondered i mean is it yeah i mean you said they're they're blurring into each other but these groups also do seem to have had 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 this sort of ideological commonality they were um islamist uh, insurgent movements it's essentially demand with a demand for an Islamic state ending uh, Western education, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, rejecting the the authority of the federal government. Has that has that also broken down? Can can you still call that those insurgents ideological in any sense now? Uh Quite honestly, it's a bit, it's somewhat difficult. Uh, it's quite clear that Muhammad Yusuf, uh, the original Yusufia movement, was yeah. ideologically bound. Uh, yeah. uh, and notwithstanding his, uh, whatever his educational or theological deficiencies were, uh, uh, that uh, Muhammad Yusuf did make an, uh, did articulate a coherent or the appearance of a coherent ideology. I don't think that can be said about most of the splinters that have resulted uh, since his uh, since his death. Uh, the Shekau faction um, mm. doesn't articulate a coherent yeah, um, theological uh, framework uh, for for what it's doing. Um, the Al Banawi faction, or what used to be the Al Banawi faction. Um, yeah. Uh, is now what has become Iswap. And in fact, um, uh, Al Banawi himself, who uh, is supposed to be the son of Muhammad Yusuf, um, right. has been overthrown, um, allegedly or reportedly. And there is now um, uh, a, a, a different leader who is been sanctioned by Daesh. Um, but you also do have at least two other factions, uh, one of which is supposedly originated from somewhere in the Bochi Gombe Highlands, and another one from Kogi State, um, uh, somewhere in north central Nigeria. Now, uh, and all of these factions um, coexist, but uh, other than a struggle over leadership and a struggle over territory, it is difficult to understand exactly what their uh, ideological um, moorings may be, whether politically or theologically. Um, but the, the signs are that their combined weight is, is, uh, is growing in terms of disrupting the country, disrupting lives, um, if not controlling territory, you're certainly denying that territory to federal police, federal military, and so on. Is that fair to say? I mean, I'll yield to Abby on this, uh, broadly speaking, but um, the, the, the fact is, I, I don't know. Uh, yes, um, I, I think it, the, the Nigerian state has not been effective 
in uh, showing that it's capable of dislodging them. I, I do think I, I don't think uh, you can we can say they don't control territory. Fact is, they do control territory uh, in Borno State at the minimum, uh, and they don't control just one local government area. I think that you know it's quite evident that uh, if you listen to uh, the testimonies of victims and indeed increasingly senior politicians, they are, they do acknowledge that this will control vast territory uh, in Borno State at the minimum. And the Nigerian state is uh, somewhat unable to assert uh, its presence in Borno State outside the state capital, outside the greater Medugri area, that's Medugri and Jerry local governments, effectively. Um, uh, and so those places have been encamped in effect uh, with the result that uh, uh, the rest of the state is not as well protected as it could be. So Bama or Baga or Mongono uh, are not as well protected as they ought to be uh, if Borno State were to be uh, properly protected by the Nigerian state and defended. Uh, there is, of course, the Multinational Joint Task Force, which at the moment is not as as fully constituted as it's, it should be. Nigeria has just appointed a new uh, commander for the MNJTF. Um, yeah. uh, but the Cameroonian contingent is still not fully constituted. The Chadian contingent is neither here nor there. Uh, the Nigerian con- contingent, uh, again, is fairly half-hearted. Uh, so it's mm. mostly multinational. Uh, I mean, it's suboptimal, let me put it that way, and sub- multinational more in, uh, in, uh, in uh, nomenclature than in reality. Right, right. Thanks. Um, uh, Abby, can I ask you uh, in in terms of just take you back momentarily to 2015 when we had the election and the, the, the thought was you had this new political formation, the All Progressives Congress is coming in. Its, it's candidate was a battle-hardened general where, we, you know, I, I, albeit back in the 60s and 70s, but still a military man who had the authority. Um, After a period where security had declined badly under good luck, Jonathan, um, what what went wrong, do you think? Because far from security conditions improving, as many people were hopeful about, they seem to have declined and the problems seem to have multiplied. Um, to what extent do you, do you look at the political f- framework for this happening and, the, uh, and, and what, what are the other factors in terms of uh, demographics uh, the, uh, and, and so forth? Um, in 2015, when uh, President Buhari was elected president, a lot of people will tell you that the reason why they had voted for President Buhari was because, of course, of his military background and, and um, the promise to deal with the insecurity, which was largely confined to the Northeast then. Also, that um, when uh, President Buhari was head of state in 1984, one of the things he claimed he had wanted to deal with was corruption. Uh, Nigerians had realized, of course, that corruption and insecurity at that point in time in 2015 were Nigeria's greatest problems, and they had hoped that it would turn things around. Unfortunately, I think that most Nigerians were not that voted for President Buhari were not born in 1984. And if they were, were either too young or that like all human beings that we forget. And then we tend to um, put on um, rose colored glasses and remember the good old days, even when the good old days were filled with human rights violations. The human rights violations um, got worse, first of all. And that um, the promise of um, dealing with a security problem Um, was no longer paramount to the president. As a matter of fact, for the first two years of his becoming president again, we were more concerned about his health and keeping him in the country than with the duty of governance. Uh, And and alongside, uh, I I think there was a lot of focus on 
who was president with very little focus on state governors and their actions and their inactions as well. Uh, you had also a youth bulge that were largely unemployed. And if you know anything about uh, Nigeria's unemployment rate, that it's risen astronomically. Uh, as at last week, we're now at 33.3% unemployment um, in the country. And also that we still have the highest number of out of school children in the world. And those numbers have grown um, in the past three months, they've even grown farther. And so we have about 15 million out of school children in Nigeria alone. The consequences of what would happen with out of school children over time um, and the unemployment, the Chidi has spoken about um, the failure to govern the spaces, uh, the failure to, to also strengthen the police force and the, the precedent, I almost said the general and I would be right, the general's insistence on keeping service chiefs that were not functional, but rather that he wanted people that he felt he could personally trust not necessarily were efficient are some of the issues that have gotten us here. Also that the corruption got worse. It got much worse. Um, in 2015, everyone spoke about the president's body language. In 2021, that body language hasn't helped because then it said a free for all, um, can all you get and get all you can. So, uh, and now we're here. Uh, to what extent is, do you look at some of this violence, particularly what we've seen in the last, I don't know, six months, the, the kidnapping gangs and so forth? Um, I hear a lot of people saying it, it's part of it is some kind of political conspiracy. Um, officials see uh, a way of accessing state resources, paying off these ransoms. These bizarre kidnapping episodes were one minute they... Uh, announced that 300 children have been taken the next hour or something. There's a there's a statement that they're it's all under control and it's just the teachers. It 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 some, seems from outside as though you know a lot of this people are trying to orchestrate. What what's your take on on how this is happening? I'm thinking particularly the episodes in, in Niger State and Zamfara recently. I'm sorry, I missed the question. Uh, uh, well, again, I, I hope Abby, I, I hope Abby can come in on this as well. Um, now, if you were to take this most recent uh, episode in Kaduna State, right, of the students in the forestry school. Yeah. Now, uh, anybody, if you if you know Kaduna City itself or Kaduna Metropolis, Kaduna is yeah. a bit of a military garrison. Yeah. This yeah. this school um is look uh, is located between the headquarters of the first division of the Nigerian army which is in Kaduna and uh the air force base which is in Kaduna and the airport which is in Kaduna and all of these and it's not too far away by the way from the command and staff college which is in Jaji okay. on yeah. the outskirts yeah. of Kaduna Right mm. now, the idea that somehow a a bunch of bandits would go to this school in the mili in the midst of these of, of in, in this military garrison and a street any number of people at all beggars belief. The idea that they can do it for as long as it takes. Now, mind you, the people that are taking the, what they are taking are human beings. They are not taking cattle or goats, or chicken, or pigs. But even if they were taking animals on that scale, 30, 40, 50, yeah, it takes, that's a considerable logistical operation. Uh, and having collected them, uh, you still have to get away from the vicinity. The idea that somebody manages to uh, have the gumption to do, to get to this place, do it, uh, and place the logistics to collect all of these people and then escape without being, without attracting any attention or any shooting, 
absolutely beggars belief. And anybody who suggests to me that that does not require complicity at some senior uh, martial level or governance level uh, must think that I am stupid or the person themselves must be very stupid. That is the only way I can put it. Now, you then begin to uh, imagine, whether it is Kagera or uh, where is the other place in Zamfara, um, mm. of, you know, where all of these things have taken place. You're walking to a school, you take 300 kids, uh, you're wearing, I don't care what you're wearing, military uniforms or angels uniforms or anything in between, and you collect this number of kids and make a way into uh, another state uh, and you want us to believe that people are not complicit in this at the level of those who should be stopping it, sod it. Mm. No, it's not yeah. possible. Yeah. Uh, and, and you can see it now, by the way, it's, it's a known fact, uh, so I'm not disclosing any state secrets here, that for a long time, it didn't start today, to be perfectly honest, but for a long time, the sums in ransoms that have been sent off to negotiate the release of the, these, um, these hostages um, in these kinds of embarrassing situations, in these inconvenient hostages, as I like to call them, uh, have always ended up being shared. So the state security agents and the political operatives who receive them uh, end up um, in joint enterprise, sharing the money. And I don't know whether you heard, but in the latest episode in, uh, I believe that was Katsina State, uh, one of the local government officials uh, uh, actually went on record to allege in a private conversation that 800 million had been disbursed, 800 million naira, which would be about what, just a little, uh, current exchange rates, a little under Two million dollars, right, yeah, right. had been disbursed for sharing, uh, uh, which was shared between some public officials and the people who did the operations, who led the, who, who did the active operation in the in the abductions. And um, uh, it was, you know, the suggestion was he had not quite got what he was supposed to, uh, uh, to get, and several others had not got what they were supposed to get. But because he blew the whistle on that. They manufactured some charges against him, and I think they are now proceeding against him uh, in criminal law. But Abby, um, uh, uh, your take may be different. No, I, I think it's yes. um, organized criminal groups negotiating with organized criminal groups, and I, I, I think that Chidi is absolutely right. So, um, organized criminal groups negotiating with organized criminal. But but there's obviously some, there seems to be some official complicity at some point within the government. Just, I mean, just to, you know, suggest, for example, well, I, I don't know, it's maybe an official in the state government or something like this. Surely this is all under the purview of the federal government. And whatever else these officials are, are gaining or losing from this, Leave aside the incredible inhumanity involved and, in, as Chidi says, moving uh, children around like cattle. You know, um, we have seen cases. Children have been shot. Children have been killed. Uh, adults have been killed in the process of this. It's, it's, it's not a, a crime without victims by any means. Um, but in political terms, it creates this image of the government losing control over the country and indeed, if, if, if the security, or large numbers of the security forces are involved in these operations, of losing, losing command and control over the security forces, doesn't it? Doesn't it raise huge political questions for the government? It, if this is it does, uh, but the government is also busy um, silencing people who could speak. And when I said organized criminal groups negotiating with organized criminal groups, I meant organized criminal groups in government itself they're negotiating with organized criminal groups that work in court with them um, to kidnap and um, perpetrate crimes in, the, in a lot of these communities. Um, you've got the instance of, the, the truth is that the political economy of the violence and of the kidnapping is too attractive to these people in government for them to care about their image. As a matter of fact, what they care about 
in their image is to ensure that the news of this does not get out, that people do not demand accountability. And so suddenly you have a flurry of laws um, against uh, uh, protecting politicians, against citizens demanding um, their rights on social media, um, wanting to control non-governmental organizations and their activities. Um, and unfortunately, that the king is naked and no one is telling him. Um, we've saw kidnapping in the in the southeast and the south south way back. I mean, ten, twenty years ago, as a kind of criminal um, organization, and, and it got very, very bad at one stage. I remember visiting Port Harcourt ten years ago, and people said, "You know, you've got to kind of we've got to sit between two very large, muscled pe- guys in the back of the car if you want to travel anywhere." Stuff like that. Um, is it very different what's happening now in the Northwest? What, uh, be, because it seemed to be those uh, the kidnapping racket in the Southeast and South South seem to be mu- much more decentralized. Some, there's a feeling that, that what's going on in the Northwest and maybe North Central as well at the moment is more organized and it involves more complicity from state officials. So while they would borrow their leaf from the South-South and the kidnappings in the South-South, there are fundamental differences. So the initial kidnaps in the South-South were ideological and they drew attention to their causes. But the kidnaps in the North is the Northwest and not Central and actually now across the country are very commercial in their, in their, method, in their methods and in their reasoning. And so there, there is no ideology behind the kidnaps other than economical. Mm. In, bo- in both cases? No. In, or, or in the Northwest? In the it's Northwest. It's purely ideological, uh, purely commercial. It's criminal. commercial. In the South-South, when it started, it was ideological. Mm. But across the country mm. right now, it's commercial. It might have tinges of political in a few instances, but far, by and large, it's commercial in nature. Um, and um, that's, that's, it is what it is right now. Uh, and and I, I guess, uh, uh, the, I mean, commercial, political, I think I tend to agree. Um, but th- there's also the factor that the um a, a lot of this is revenue um revenue uh, and b- because uh, money on this scale uh, you, you, we're not talking about a, a few hundreds of uh, or thousands of dollars yeah we're speaking of millions of dollars um right. that revenue is used to buy high caliber weapons or acquire uh, new cash of or new caches of high caliber weapons um, which then enable them to uh, forge more formidable criminal crime gangs uh, and form more formidable political gangs. Um, uh, and these are then sold to politicians uh, for elections. So there is actually a joint enterprise here um, that is not just, uh, you know, uh, and this is where the element of state complicity is self-evident. In the, you know, in Southeast and South-South, you couldn't actually say that there was state complicity or indeed with the cults in parts of Lagos. The state is actually committed, and you can see it, to fighting these things in those places, no matter how inadequately. But in what we are seeing, it seems, and this was, uh, you know, this was partly affirmed by the Gaji Galtimari report into Boko Haram in 2011 and by the uh, Turaki report in 2013 into into Nigeria's insecurity, both of which were presidential panels that investigated the first one, Boko Haram, and the second one, the origins of Nigeria's insecurity pathologies. And they did suggest then, uh, that was what, eight years ago now uh, to uh, 10 years ago, that there was joint and emerging joint enterprise between politicians and some of these uh, gangs um, or or, or whatever you call them. And that is proving to be perfectly accurate 
uh, made for this moment. Right. Uh, so, I mean, so this is fund. Is this going to fundamentally change the way politics is done in Ni- in Nigeria, or is it a reinforcement? I mean, we had ten ten years again. Ten years ago, we had the um, political gangs. For example, again in the south south, uh, there were the the candidates with their militants and the political gangsters backing them. But this, as you say, it, it this it, this has started already with the complicity of serving state government officials. Um, are, are we seeing a kind of a, a breakdown of the party system? And it's it, it's actually going to be between rival gangsters, if you like. Some might wear a PDP hat, some might wear an APC hat. It's been with rival gangsters for a while. I've, I've, I've said in, on a number of occasions that we're currently being run by gangs and that this is just consolidating that system. So already, for example, in some states, particularly in the South-South, you have former cult gang members in the House of Assembly. We're going to see more of that as long as we're, we continue on this trajectory, um, that they will continue to um, vie for the top till um, they become less, dis- the, the, the people at the base become um, just dissatisfied with just money and then want more power and want political power. And so we'll build that succession system, or rather they've started to build that succession system. So this is consolidating, in my opinion. And I, I, I don't know what Chidi thinks. So. I totally agree. Completely. So it, you, you're saying, I mean, when we started this conversation, Chidi, you were saying that, the, you know, the, these various sort of conflict pathologies um, have a blurring to some i mean some of the gangs behind this violence i mean are they they're at conflict with other gangs i mean you know we see uh we hear competition for mining resources for example gold resources in in zamfara that sort of pitches the the gangs uh against each other so you've got sort of Political fights and resource fights going on at the same time. So, I mean, I mean, uh, Abby, do you want to take that? Abby has done. Uh, Abby has spent most of her life working on these issues of informal uh, artisanal mining and associated violence. Chidi, uh-huh. I don't know if you would remember that about ten years ago, when we had um, issued an advisory to the government about the insecurity around mining, particularly in Zamfara, in Zamfara and that the yeah. killings had started as far back as then. So we'd issued this advisory in, two, in, in 2011, about, yeah, exactly about 10 years ago. Uh, and the killings had started then. And it was very clear that this was also a number of displaced or missionary, um, missionary terrorists whose jobs are also to ensure that the minerals um, can feed the conflict. And we had won the government then that the minerals in Nigeria, across Nigeria, particularly in artisanal mining, will eventually feed the conflict. It's 2021 and it's exactly that. And that this, there are no simple answers to this question. So you, you're not going to say, oh, it's just around the minerals. It's also around the politics. It's around the minerals. It's around the politics. Mm. And it's around the, the political economy of ensuring that the conflict is perpetrated. It's also around the um, ungoverned borders. So Zamfara shares borders with Niger Republic and that the communities close to Zamfara and the communities in Zamfara where gold mining has been going on for a while are in constant conflict. And there are also a lot of reprisal attacks. There are also a lot of um, machinery attacks and reprisals after that. But at the root of everything is impunity. We also have a lot of arms crossing over from Niger to Nigeria. For example, across Nigeria right now, there are no fewer than 6 million um, small arms in the arms of non-state actors. And that a lot of miners are um, very, uh, just like the others, that they traverse from one end of the country to the other um, in in search of minerals and that they carry along with them this arms. So sometimes that they're they're miners 
Other times they're mercenaries uh, and other times they're uh, political gangs that uh, work for politicians in the downtimes of, of, of mining and uh, acting as mercenaries for community. So it's, it's complex. It's, it's not a single reason for what's going on in Zambara. So well, what we can say is that those functions overlap and you need to carry out those functions. You need to be well armed, need- preferably with something like an AK-47. Exactly. Right. Um, so just to bring in another pathology, um, which is the, the herd of farmer clashes that we saw in the in the uh, um, in North Central uh, Middle Belt, uh, which again ha- incre- have increased pretty sharply over the last six years. It seemed that ni- initially that when you saw a kind of um, upswing in these clashes, there was some link with the political calendar. Uh, a state would be up for elections or something like that, or officials within that state. But now it seems to be slightly independent of that. I, I just wondered what uh, what you thought again uh, to what is driving that at the moment um, is because a uh, the herd of farmer clashes seem to be moving ever further southwards, and, and what's what's behind that is all, that also political or is it more commercial and resource oriented well um th- there's a theory and i'll say theory only at this moment uh I mean, if you notice uh, the the most um controversial or the most notable of those incidents involving uh armed herders have re- recently been reported in the southwest of nigeria and to traverse from the heading territories of Nigeria in north of the savannah to the southwest. Mm. You've got to pass through the middle belt. For some reason, however, uh, uh, they've not been reporting a lot of killings in the middle belt. Uh, uh, no, it's not that uh, they've not been taking place. They've just not, not been as intense as the incidents reported in the southwest of Nigeria. And one theory is that, the, is that this is part of an unfolding political contest between the southwest and the Northwest over succession to President Buhari and control of the ruling APC party. Um, Now, who the instigator may be, uh, anyone, is anybody's guess. Uh, Whether it is, where they come from in Nigeria is anybody's guess. But uh, the the, the theory is certainly up and about that the uh, rise in these incidents uh, and in insecurity in the greater southwest of Nigeria uh, is not unconnected with uh, the question of uh, the Nigerian presidential elections 2023 and the processes of party primaries, of selection of major party candidates, which are likely to begin sometime at the end of towards the end of this year. Okay, right, right. I mean, I also was chatting to um, a, a, a good friend in Oyo State who's actually involved in artisanal mining there. And he's quite alarmed. What what he said was truckloads of miners coming down in uh, vehicles registered in Zamfara State. And he, and he, I mean, he's a Lagos guy, but he, he he's lived for a long time in the North. He knows the situation. And he says, if something isn't done about that, he sees that this spinning out of control in, in, in a turn of a resource fight that also has regional overtones. I mean, you know, and looking at situations like that on a sort of local level with the kind of political rhetoric we've been seeing in the last six months, a sort of turbocharging of identity politics, it seems to be very fissile at the moment. Would you agree where a particularly risky point at the moment we shouldn't be at a risky point if there is leadership but there isn't and therefore every point is very risky uh, uh, let's 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 let, let's be clear um this the, you know the the link between artisanal mining and uh, and uh, mass atrocities in nigeria is as old as probably the kafanchan riots of 1987 right. Now, right. uh, in 1986, uh, uh, you know, in the mid 1980s, you know, rubies and 
gemstones were discovered in what is now called Southern Kaduna, you know, in Bajuland, in Southern Kaduna, of you know, near Kafanchan. And mm. artisanal mining broke out in Bajuland, and, and people came from everywhere, Sudan, Senegal, uh, Chad, Niger, all of them converged on Southern Kaduna. And many of them arrived, you know, a struggle ensued for a control of plots, and many of them arrived with guns. Um, now, in 1986, President Babangida, who was Nigeria's military ruler then, uh, intervened because this was getting ungovernable and uh, chased quite a good number of them out of the country or, or tried to uh, deport and expel as many of them as he could lay hands on. Right now, it appears to be a combination of the, the theory is there's a political competition ahead of the, the next presidential elections and the the fight between various candidates in the Southwest and also, uh, but also a resource battle. Um, so could, could we turn quickly, we mentioned the South-South earlier, um, and now there appears to be a kind of, again, a, res- a resurgence of um, activity, uh, but the piracy uh, and also uh, the re-entry onto the stage of uh, Dokubu Asari, who was very well known a decade or so ago as, as a militant leader. Maybe f- first, uh, first uh, Asari... Where does he fit into the picture now? Because he appears to be claiming leadership of this uh, Southeast secessionist movement. Uh, what is what is the agenda there? <laughs> Abby, do you want to try? This is yours. Oh, the uh, of course you know the. Um, Maritime insecurity in the Gulf of Guinea, to begin with, is is a huge issue and has been for a while. And uh, I mean, in the in the uh, estimation of the uh, IMO, the International Maritime Organization, the Gulf of Guinea probably presents um, the, uh, the the most insecure waters uh, globally, uh, 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 maritime corridor certainly globally. Now that takes some doing when you consider. Um, all the other places uh, from the uh, you know from the Straits of Gibraltar, uh, the um, or even uh, quite obviously the Gulf of Aden, um, but um, the the uh, situation is not helped, of course, by the inabilities uh, of the Nigerian Navy, uh, which really is the should be the major uh, maritime actor. A maritime enforcer in 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 that region, uh, and so uh, that's the first thing. And the inland waterways, uh, that insecurity extends to inland waterways uh, that empty themselves onto the um, the the uh, uh, Atlantic uh, on the uh, uh, and that that would of course include uh, the River Niger system, which begins in Guinea, uh, or the Rashi River system, which empties into the Niger. And 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 has a lot of um, uh, outlets in in the um, in the creeks of of the Niger Delta. Now, and Asari Dokubo, whom you've mentioned, uh, is one of those people who uh, established himself in that enterprise. You know, in the decade before last, really, uh, in, in the first ten years of uh, the millennium. Uh, now, the situation is that the indigenous peoples of Biafra, IPOB, uh, which uh, is leading the secessionist movement, uh, over, uh, 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 named after the old Biafra, um, is led by a figure called Nambikanu, who is now living uh, out in the United Kingdom. Um, and there's been a splintering within IPOB uh, between Namdekanu, who is the leader, uh, self-proclaimed, of course, and his deputy, mm-hmm. Uche Mefo, who also mm-hmm. lives in the United Kingdom. Uche Mefo has splintered from Namdekanu. Namdekanu has uh, outlawed, in, in quotes, Uche Mefo's faction, therefore, of 
uh, iPod. But Nnamdi Dekanu himself has been a controversial figure in the self-determination movements of the Southeast and South-South. And so what has happened is you've had a reconfiguration and Mepho, who is not as charismatic as Nnamdi Dekanu, but who is credited with more considerable organizational nows, has teamed up with a coalition of actors. Uh, so he is in a loose coalition with Ralph Wazurike, who is the leader of the movement for the actualization of the sovereign state of Biafra, uh, and also with Asari Dokubo, who, although he is from Calabari in River State, uh, actually has a grandmother who is Igbo. Uh, and so he calls himself Alaboy Diabali of Calabari, uh, but basically he is uh, 25% Igbo. Um, uh, and that f- for him, uh, and then he also asserts that Biafra is a claim, uh, is a community that includes not just the Igbos, but also the uh, mi- the minorities uh, or, or the uh, communities of River State, uh, uh, m- indeed much of what is now known as the Niger Delta, except a Doe State. That is their claim, and that is what they are doing. But uh, if you notice, they say this is customary government of Biafra. So that they, that is the distinction they are making with uh, Namdekanu's IPOB. Uh, so they are not saying they are setting up a Biafra. They are setting up a customary government. Now, make of that what you will. Uh, and I, I think that is what has led to the fact, to, to the contest between them and government because nobody can quite work out what customary government means. Right, right. Um, but where this is leading is an intensification of hostilities between um, this, those militants in the Southeast and the federal government. I mean, we, we've seen uh, what during the NSARS protests, there were the, those pretty ugly scenes yeah, w- between the IPOB guys and the, and the soldiers and so on. I, I've seen quite a bit of stuff in the press saying that the soldiers don't seem to be at all worried about going for the uh, IPOB groups in a way that they would not do in the Northeast. Um, so we seem to be heading towards an, uh, an, yeah, an intensification of this. I mean, how, I mean, there were also the use recently of helicopter gunshot ships on uh, um, camps linked to this Eastern Security Network, which is said to be the kind of armed wing of uh, IPOB. Um, now, th- how this, this, is we really, this is where the road meets the tarmac in this in the conversation with reference to the southeast. Um, uh, it's not it's no longer IPOB or indeed the customary government of Biafra. Mm. Something is happening, and I don't think anyone can say for a fact what it is at the moment. Um, yeah. uh, if but if you've tracked the mortality rate of security agents agents in the southeast recently, mm. it has spiked, and it has not spiked on a regular gradient, it has spiked on a vertical gradient. Um, basically, security agents are being killed and wiped out uh, in the southeast on a daily basis. Nobody mm. quite knows who is doing it. And yeah. I'm, I'm not quite sure that uh, people are sure it is the Eastern Security Network uh, or whatever that means, uh, who the Eastern Security Network is. The helicopter gun ships, um, uh, let me declare my interest, um, we are actually uh, sent to my local government area, also local government area, right. um, which is shares a boundary with Ihiala local government area uh, in uh, Anambra State, both in southeast Nigeria. Now, I was born in on that Anambra side, and my parents are from the uh, Imo State side, and the helicopter gunships were smack bang on the boundary between these two local government areas. Now the allegation is that they were targeted at um, at uh, uh, suspected uh, at forests, which were supposed to be training camps of uh, alleged to be training camps of the so-called Eastern Security Network. I can tell you for a fact because these are parts of the world where I grew up, I trekked in, I know every blade of grass quite literally in that neighborhood. There are no longer any forests left. Um, yeah. This part of the country is very densely populated, and human settlement has cleared up the forests in which kids like me, uh, you know, 
learned the you know the basic tools of the trade of of uh, subsistence agriculture uh, when we were growing up. So uh, there is nothing like a forest in Lilu or in Osu where these attacks took place. Whoever says that does not know the law of the land. Uh, but it is true that there are attacks on security agents uh, that are quite clearly intolerable and condemnable taking place. And they've been taking place since about, about November last year. And they've been spiking rather unnaturally. Uh, on, uh, you know, as we are, uh, as on this particular day that we're doing this, uh, uh, at least four prison warders have been massacred, uh, in a place called the Kulobia in Anambra State. They took, they went to court for proceedings and they were attacked, uh, unarmed in the vehicles in which they went to court and slaughtered. Uh, and nobody should tolerate that or, or, or think that is the way to go, but that's basically what is happening yesterday. Some other officers were burnt in their vehicles uh, not too far away from this same location we're talking about, and it goes on. Uh, so something is going on. I don't think anyone can say for a certain that it is Eastern Security Network, or indeed that there is an Eastern Security Network. But the and the targets the these security officials they're they're gunning for are essentially linked to the state government, are they? Or are they federal or are they both? Federal assets. Fed, federal. Yes. So it could be, I mean, in theory, it could be some couched as a kind of political campaign against the federal government in Abuja. If not quite if clearly, the political business model in Nigeria has become government respects those who shoot at them. Right. All right. So, um, you know, you start with the Niger Delta. And mm. the militancy rose and President Obasanjo offered them the vice presidency. And from the vice presidency, Yaradua died, they became president. And then uh, while Jonathan, uh, as Yaradua took over power and was getting ill, uh, Yusuf was killed, Mohammed Yusuf was killed and Boko Haram took off and then became the arrowhead for the opposition to Jonathan. Uh, and so as Boko Haram escalated, Jonathan became uh, less popular. By 2015, he was ousted. And so I think people have taken it now. And if you even go back, uh, you know, General Abacha ousted uh, or wiped out the, the, the peaceful protesters or demonstrators uh, in, in Ogoni land, and they were replaced by armed gangs. And from since then, Ogoni land and the Niger Delta started getting greater allocations. Uh, they got NDDC as a result. They got 13.3% as a result. And so everyone now believes unless you take guns against the Nigerian state, you don't get anything. So this really is my own theory. I, I'm, I'm not mm -hmm. ascribing it to any other person. But people have seen that the political business model in Nigeria respects guns. Therefore, if you want to have a seat at the table, come with your guns. But Abby may think may may have a, a view on that. No, but I I totally agree with you. So it, it's it's um whoever is armed, and then when you think back to NSARS and you contrast NSARS to the armed groups and government's treatment of of unarmed protesters and their um decision to. Um, negotiate with armed bandits, it, it tells you exactly um, how this government thinks. Um, we've got a f about five minutes left. I j uh, um, thanks so much for taking us through these various conflict pathologies, if you describe them. I wanted to end really with your view, maybe first Abby and then Chidi, um, on <laughs> the, the worst question of all. What is the way out of this? What I mean, obviously, isn't there are many, many things that need to be put into place. But I wondered if you could run through, you know, within a minute, two minutes, three minutes, you know, what you consider to be the priorities to deal with the the complexity of the the security challenge to to the country and and, and measures that could actually stop things getting worse and the the politics fracturing further? Um, first, I would say, yeah. So first, I would say that there are no low-hanging fruits and we shouldn't expect quick results. Um, this problems 
uh, started over a long span of time and that they're going to take a while at, um, to resolve. So first of all, I would say that um, I, I'm not thinking of the hard security um, architecture of Nigeria, but the other issues of human security, ensuring that we, we end uh, the number of out-of-school children in Nigeria, uh, ensuring that human rights are respected, ensuring that impunity ends, because at the core of what's going on in Nigeria is impunity right across the country, um, ensuring that we're also able to build a real democracy. Chidi spoke a lot about the ungoverned spaces. The question is, how do we utilize those spaces in a, in a way that actually uh, benefits Nigerians and improves the economy rather than continuing to invest time and again in, in, in what doesn't work? Uh, I'm sure Chidi has a lot more to to, to say. Thanks, thanks no, very much. Not 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 at all, really, Abby. Um, the only other thing I would add is leadership and leadership recruitment. Uh, um, I, I, and because I, I think the major strategy of the government, the, the Nigerian government, to this situation has been very kinetic, um, uh, or, or polykinetic. Uh, you know, deploy uh, soldiers and deploy. Uh, police officers, and they're all getting slaughtered and killed uh, because they're demotivated, not properly cared for, not properly led, and all of that. And the army and security services have been uh, depleted as a result, and their credibility also shot. Um, but I think it's also a wrong diagnosis because the problem really is a political problem. It's a leadership problem and a leadership recruitment and replacement problem. And unless we have proper political leadership, the situation is going to get worse. Uh, it's just, there is no other way to put it. So the two leading political parties, APC, which is incumbent at the federal level, and PDP, which it replaced, have got to get their acts together and give the country options of leaders who can provide the leadership out of this situation. And you don't see, building on that, you don't see the emergence of any alternative political party or political force to challenge the hegemony of those two main political parties in Nigeria? Precisely because of what Abi said, the fact that the politics has itself been criminalized and political leaders are effectively bosses of criminal gangs. Uh, I, I, you know, uh, you know Bola Tinubu in Lagos State, for instance, when he celebrated his birthday last year, one of Nigeria's leading journalists, Dele Momodu, whom you may know, uh, yes. tweeted out a, a, a greeting to him, hailing the capo di tutti capi. All right? I, 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 and I, re, I recall this very well because I responded to Dele and said, the only person whom you greet as a capo di tutti capi is a boss of a criminal gang. But yeah. when you describe a political leader as a capo di tutti capi, and that and that is supposed to be uh, a, a, a constructive greeting. It's, it says something about the politics. This is how I sum it up. That's all for this week. I hope you enjoyed today's podcast. And a special thanks again to our guests, Abiodun Bayuan and Chidi Odinkalu. You can always catch our previous episodes and all our features online at theafricareport.com. Now, if you enjoyed this podcast, do rate and review us on your favorite platform. For The Africa Report, this is Anne-Marie Basada. Thanks for listening.